Beautiful sounds of pipe organs. I don't know anything about you, but I don't sing pipe organs in this church. Rose, are you learning pipe organs? No. Um, it's just one chord. Just one. It's like a big one. It's just quiet and silent. I'm thinking, look, God, you've got something for me today. And it happened again, just one chord. Beautiful and chalk pipe organs. I felt like I was standing back on the campus of Duke University in their chapel, chapel listening to the beautiful pipe organs they have in their chapel. Um, and it's happened a third time during praise and worship. Three times this week. Beautiful pipe organs have been playing in this church where there is none. I'm ready to see God's presence fall in this place. Amen. I'm ready for us to be on our knees, worshiping Him. Oh, I just had to, I had to share what I heard. Amen. Amen. Is almost workman's count there. <laughs> you know what? I said it once this week, the guys on the moon. I don't know if he was here when we last, the Holy Spirit was moving, but please don't quench the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Because God can do so much more than we can even imagine. The Bible says that. I think it's in Ephesians chapter 3. But I think that we need to understand that. That we can make a difference in people's lives. And God's doing some awesome things here. I was going through, I'm working on the <laughs> testimony book. And if you have a testimony, please write it down and give it to me. Or type it up on your computer and give it to me. That way I won't put my wife through a lot when I try to type it up. <laughs> Amen? How many of you like my wife? Okay. Janice, they didn't all raise their hand. <laughs> but while I was going through it and I was retyped some for some people and was getting it all thing, God spoke to me and says, How about your testimonies? I said, Really, God? <laughs> I have so many that I've seen God do. It's been awesome. I wish you would see all that I've seen and maybe some of you have seen more. But it's been quite a ride for me. And God's an awesome God. So if you have a testimony, please give it to me so I can put it in this book and we can put it out on the table or somewhere where people can come in and we can say, here, read this. This is what God's doing. They just don't want to hear what God did in this. They want to see that he's still doing it today. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. By the way, that last song we saying that is an awesome song. I can sing that all the time. You know? It's got such an anointing on it. I you know you hear it in many different versions, but it's got and I called Steve and I said, Are you gonna sing that song and be saying at this yep, it's on the schedule. I said, okay. 
And by the way, you did a great job playing that. That was awesome. I thought it was a CD or something. That was awesome. Chapter 9, verse 14. Just to set the stage here, it's talking about sowing generously. And he's talking about a church that didn't have much, but they still sold to the kingdom of God. And it's just a, a precious gift. You know, the lady that only had the might gave more than all the rest of them because she gave out of her need and not out of her abundance. Amen? We're going to talk about soul and reaping. We're going to talk about money. I don't think I've ever talked about money here. And it's not like we're in bad shape. Don't get nervous. And it's not like I want more money. It's just that there's principles in giving. And if you don't know them, you're missing out. Okay? There's spiritual principles about everything in the Bible. And if you get a hold of them, they work in your life. And it makes a difference. Verse 14. And then their prayers you and for you, their hearts will go out to you because of your surpassing grace God has given you. The surpassing grace God has given you. Missy was talking about that this morning. And when she said that, I thought, she's going to steal my sermon. <laughs> but you see, that's the way the Holy Spirit, she called me up this week and she said, you think it'd be all right if I played the special? And she said, yeah. And she said, I'm going to pray Amazing Grace. And I thought, hmm, that's what I'm going to speak about. I don't think I told her that at the time. Thanks be, verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. What is that gift to you? His indescribable gift. <clears throat> Grace. You know, we start out in the church, we're all sinners, we all got different backgrounds, we've all got some bad things in our backgrounds, things we did wrong, sometimes it's out of ignorance because we didn't know the Word of God, sometimes it's just because we wanted to feel good, whatever it is, but we come to Jesus and He give us the revelation of salvation and His grace. Well, you was yet a sinner. And then it's like once we become a Christian, we accept Jesus, and then we want to put all these rules on it. And if I don't pray so much, I'm not going to get healed. If I don't do this, show up for church so many times, I'm not going to get healed. You know what you're doing? You're kicking it right back over to works. You're putting yourself right back under the law, and a lot of people in church are under the law, and they're not free. Amen? They're miserable. Because they don't understand grace. We do it to our kids. The church does it to us. Or you got to pray so many times, you got to read so many scriptures every week. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, and then God will bless you. What have you just done? You turned it into works. God's not going to bless you unless you work for it. That ain't grace. You know what grace is? I told him, she asked me. Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, but God has chosen to give it to you. That's an indescribable gift. How do you describe that gift? You don't have to work for it. God just said, I love you so much, I'm going to send my son to die on the cross. You accepted him with all the baggage, you accepted him. And then when we get in church, we're taught that we got to be good enough. Hello. As far as I know, 
We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? And if you didn't do it today, you're going to do it tomorrow. Just piping off at my wife or, you know, getting upset or whatever. Not trusting God. But you know what? There's forgiveness for that. But you have to run to Jesus and confess your sin. Now, how many of you know that you probably not confessed the sin in your life? I mean, can we get them all? And all we got to say is, God, I'm a sinner. Amen? I've fallen short of your glory, and I need the indescribable gift of Jesus. I need that in my life. It's not about how many hallowed we is. It's not about how much we do. It's about, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Does he know you? How many of your kids was perfect growing up? Okay, let's get a little more personal. How many of you was perfect growing up? <laughs> no, Fred, you missed a mark. <laughs> Fred's back there raising. Right? <laughs> you may have thought you was perfect. But I can find somebody in your family that says you're not perfect. And you see, we need Jesus. We need this gift. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm here somewhere. Okay, who stole my Ephesians? I even got a mark. Chapter 2, verse 8. For it's by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. It is not from what? Yourself. It is a what? From God. Hopefully we're all going to receive gifts this Christmas. You know? And it's free. But you know what we do with that? Well, if you bought me a gift, I'm going to give you a gift. Hello. We stopped that in our in our family. Uh, I said, now look, you buy me something for so much, I buy you something for so much. Why don't we just all keep our money and we can get what we want? Hello? We get together and have Christmas and we play, we buy $10, $20 gifts or whatever and play bingo with them, you know. And the kids get more fun out of that. We buy the little kids all gifts. But, but you know what? A gift is free. It has no strings attached. And yet we want to attach strings to God's gift. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something for God. You're going to do something for God because you love him and what he did for you. <laughs> that he give you this grace. You didn't deserve this grace. God gave it to you freely. So you can't do enough thinking you're going to bless God to get healed. There you are putting strings on it. And God says it's unconditional love. How many of us really understand unconditional love? You start to when you become parents. Amen? You start to understand it when you become parents. <coughs> Because like I asked you, how many of your kids are perfect? And you're going to say they've all blown it. 
once or twice at least. My wife used to tell him, I brought you into this world and I could take you out. <laughs> I know none of you would, the pastor's wife said that, <laughs> but none of you would ever say that, right? <laughs> My wife does not have a mercy gift, I just want you to know that. <laughs> It's kind of black and white to her. <laughs> Verse 9. Not by works, so that no one can boast. And we would do that. Well, I'm so spiritual that God is doing this for me. Because I'm doing everything right. You're a liar. You're not doing everything right. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So what you have to really realize is that you need Jesus. In your life. You could have bad thoughts one morning. And... That's not bad in itself, but if you let it roost in your head, then it becomes sin. You read James chapter 1. Sin is a process. It starts with the thought. And then when you start thinking about that same thing all the time, then you commit sin. Amen? Watch what you're thinking. Just because those thoughts come in there doesn't mean it's sin yet. It's when you start dusting them off and playing with those thoughts in your mind, then it can become sin. It becomes a potential of being sin. The more you play with it and pamper it and put it in your head, and then you end up doing it. Simply because you was meditating on it. How's that work for you? Why don't you meditate on what God says about you? Because really when you're thinking about evil, you're thinking about bad things. You're meditating on those things. And you just need to tell them to get out of here and start thinking about God's things. But it'll turn it around for the good. Amen? Verse 10, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's already got a plan for your life, and he's got plans for good works in your life, and he's got it all set up. It's whether you do them or you don't do them. That's your choice. But don't let the enemy mess with your mind. Think on the good things, the Bible says. Good and pure things. Go to John 3.16. We all know this by heart. We knew it when we was little kids. We was taught in Sunday school, and if we said that first, guess what? We got a gift. We got a sticker. If we come every Sunday, we got a attendance star or whatever it was, I forget. It's been that many years ago. But we direct everything to good works, which are bad. Because God created him for us. But do it because you love him. And that he has given you grace. An indescribable gift. That you don't have to worry about your sin no more. And that's why people are miserable as Christians. Is because they're sin conscious. I was listening to Andrew Walmack. And he was talking about that this week. We're more sin conscious than we are God conscious. We think about our sins all the time. 
And we're not thinking about God. We think about how easy is it to think about things you did wrong in the past. All you got to do is have an idle mind. And that's the devil's what? It's just amazing how true the Bible is, isn't it? Written 2,000 years ago, approximately. And it's still alive today. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he, what? He gave. Love will make you, will motivate you and make you do something. You married your wife, didn't you? Or your husband. Love for kids will cause you to do something. God's love for you caused him to do something. He gave his one and only son that whoever what? Yes. Believes him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes that's what you got to do. Everywhere in the Bible faith has to be believed. Believed. And if you don't believe it, you're not going to get it. That's the bottom line. Jesus couldn't do miracles in his own hometown because why? They didn't believe. He was a carpenter's son. We do that to people all the time. Oh, well, they're just that. But the bottom line is they're God's children if they know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to what? Condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. Pretty simple, isn't it? Then why do you think God's against you? He's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. Even though you sin, He's not mad. Did you get really mad at your kids when they did something wrong? Well, you could have. But most of the time you forget them. Because of why? Because there's love there. And it's unconditional. That's why God gave us kids. Amen? But to save the world through him... Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. What's the belief for God is believing in his Son. You're condemned if you don't believe. You're not condemned if you believe. Hello? Now God knows your relationship with him. He knows how intense it is or how unintense it is with him. He already knows that. You're not gonna you're not gonna fool God. Because he already knows. So you can't play games with God. And as long as you stay in Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You step outside of him, you deny him, and your sins aren't covered anymore. Some churches believe once saved, always saved. I, can, I believe part of that, but I believe if you deny Jesus Christ, any time in your life you become a Christian and then there's a time where you walk away from him and say, I deny him, I don't believe you're saved. Because you're rejecting and you're not believing in Jesus. And the only one that can save you. So don't stop believing. Trust in him. 
Know that he's going to turn it around for the good. You got to believe that in your heart. So it's not by works, it's by what? Believe me. Amen. Doesn't that simplify it? But you are going to serve him and you are going to do things for him because you love him. The same reason he did it for you. Because of love. And we're, trying, we're still trying to figure out unconditional love. Um, <clears throat> love. You know, one of the hardest things is the benevolence one for me. Is because... <clears throat> You know there's people that need that don't ask it. You know there's people that are just taking advantage of it. But you've got to give it in the fact that, you know what? they got to deal with God. People take advantage. We had to cut ours down just to, to the people in the Walter School District simply because... Unless it's, it's unless it's somebody from the church or family, okay? But simply because Pioneer was calling us, Hillsdale was calling us. All around this area was always, because you know why? Because Betzer is B, and the people that are in need, they call a social worker or somebody that says, well, go to the thing and start calling churches. And when you're B, you get a lot of calls. Amen? We want to take care of our people. If you're in need, let us know. That's what we're to do first. Take care of our people. Then we reach out into the community. Amen? Go to John 10. Verse 17. <laughs> the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive, see, from my Father. You know what? What is he talking about? Sacrifice. He laid down his life because he loved you. He laid down his life because he loved the Father. And he thought more of us than he thought of himself. That's pretty strong love, isn't it? Now let me ask you a question. What if our whole church was that way? What if the whole church in the United States was that way? That we thought more of others than we think of us, our comfort, our desires, whatever. That's being the living sacrifice, amen? And we do it because of the undescribable gift of grace that God has given. He said, I can, I can lay it down and I can pick it back up. You know why? Because he conquered sin and death. He's the only one that's ever lived a, a perfect life. And that gives him the authority to conquer death. Amen? And you know what? Because of that, we get to reap the benefits of what Jesus did for us. And we get unconditional love. Oh, that we would learn to give unconditional love to everybody else. And not worry about being taken advantage of. You think Jesus worried about that? 
He did it for the ones that would receive it. He stood in front of the crowd to be persecuted. He stood in front of them to be, be made guilty when he wasn't guilty. He was innocent. He could have called 10,000 angels down and he chose not to. Why did he choose not to? Why did he choose not to? So that he could fulfill God's will. Pastor Jason, Jason put something on the church and it said that we, it's about missing church or something. That we had to make a reason or something to be in church instead of to miss church and went something like that. Look it up on Facebook, it's on there. But a lot of times we make up reasons not to be in church. And we ought to make up reasons not to miss church. Amen? I mean, you know, church is coming every Sunday. And I understand you got family. I'm not down and on that. you got things. But when you start missing and missing and missing them, you know, what's really happening is you're shorting us of a blessing. And you're a blessing. And God's a good God, amen? Do you know this undescribable gift? Have you accepted this undescribable you got to believe. And you're not condemned if you believe. You're condemned only when you don't believe. Because knowing Jesus, sin don't matter. Sin is dead to us. I got another scripture that I, I got three more, but we, we're running late. But what I want you to get out of this is how great of a gift that God has given us just in salvation. And then what we've talked about the last couple months of heaven and eternal life that he has for you beyond this world. And that's when dying's looking pretty good. Pastor, you're nuts. Paul said it. For me to die is gain. If you really believe what's on the other side, why are we so afraid of dying? Because this is the only life we know. Amen? But God's word is telling you about life after this. But if you don't believe, you can't have it. I was talking to man. <laughs> I've been after this guy for years. I was talking to him on the phone yesterday. And I said, well, I'll see you in church tomorrow. No, all that goes to church is hypocrites. I said, really? I said, I'll tell you what. You can come to our church. And I said, if you don't like it, you don't ever have to come back. He goes, really? Well, then what's the use of me coming the first time? I says, because you need Jesus. You know? But God hasn't opened his spiritual eyes to see. God hasn't given this revelation that we call an indescribable gift. And you really ought to thank God because you understand because it is a revelation from God. I heard it when I was growing up. My mom drove me to church every Sunday, and I heard it and heard it and heard it, but it didn't mean nothing to me until I was 18 years old, and God got a hold of my heart. And all I could do, like she said, all I could do, the, I went up to the pastor and he said, what do you mean? I said, we need to talk. And we went in the back room and we were talking and all I could do was cry. I couldn't even tell him what was going on. I said, I see it. Before it was just words. <clears throat> Jesus died for my sins. It was just words. 
But when the reality of that sinks into your heart and you realize what we just said is so true that he did it for you, you personally, it becomes new life. And you want to tell everybody. And not everybody's going to understand what you've got. Amen? They're not going to understand it. You know what they're going to say? We'll just see how long you last. Because they've seen it over and over. People come to Christ, get excited, and then as soon as something wrong happens in their life, they're mad at God again. Aren't you glad that God doesn't get mad at you? Hello? God's an awesome God. We've seen awesome things. We've seen God do miracles. And you need to come expecting. Because if you come not expecting, guess what you're going to get? You're going to hear the testimonies of somebody here in pipe organs. Or somebody smelling a scent that goes through the whole church. Those are signs and wonders. You wonder how in the world that happened. And you don't have to figure it out. You know, that's our problem. We want to figure God out. Well, now who in this room is smart enough to do that? Not me. You don't have to figure out everything God does. If you did, you would never sleep at night. And maybe you're up thinking about what he does, why he did it. But this indescribable gift, this gift of grace, this gift of salvation, when we don't even deserve it, you accept it. And then you want to put yourself right back under the law. You know what? Just live free in Jesus. Okay? If you sin, go to him. He's always going to be there with open heart. You know, through the Old Testament, all he wanted Israel to do is to come back to him. And he even put it like this, you're committing an adultery. You're sleeping with another God. But you know what? He was always ready to bring them back. And if you're there, he's always ready to bring you back. That's how great his love is. You don't deserve it. But God has chosen to give it to you. And when you get that in your heart, you'll serve him because you love him. You'll become a sacrifice to everybody else because you love what Jesus did for you. It's not what the people do for you. It's what Jesus did for you. You know, we was talking Wednesday night. We're talking about Joshua going into the promised land. And I believe God's got a promised land for each and every one of us. And I told him Sunday night, I said, I'm there. I'm in my promised land. I got a church that believes that Jesus can do anything. And everything's going well. I love my job. I got the best boss there ever could be. And if it wasn't for people, I could be a good pastor. Oh, I had to throw that in. <laughs> I said that to some pastors. They said, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. You know. <laughs> but you know what? I'm in a good part of my life. And I've seen a lot of things God has done. And you guys. And it's awesome. Do I get frustrated? Yes, I do. Moses couldn't lead to people where they didn't want to go. And I can't either. But if we all want to do what God has for us, it's just like the candlelight service. It's just like the Tuesday night children's program. And, and I stop and think of how many people in our church is helping the Wesleyan church with Tuesday nights. How many people in our church is helping uh, the food bank now? 
we got volunteers that go up there and help with the food bank. And that's a testimony that you're willing to serve because Jesus died for you. Because you ain't getting a paycheck, are you? I'm the only one that gets a paycheck. Oh, the one that takes care of the church does. So, cleans it. But I don't do it for the paycheck. I want to see everybody set free and enjoy Jesus and enjoy life. Amen. That's what it's about. And I've got to see that. Over the years I've been here, I've got to see people getting set free and coming to the knowledge of Jesus, unconditional love, and everything. <laughs> and people come up to me like by Sunday night. There's just something different about this church. And I want to say, yeah, we're all weird. Amen. <laughs> and people come in here and say, there's something different. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. I asked you quite a few weeks ago, where do you want to go? Where do we go from here, where we're at? Because I can't do it alone. I can't be a one-man band. Now, Ruth can. One woman band, excuse me. So you can play all kinds of guitar and piano and I don't know what else. And some of you got so many gifts. And I was proud of our church Sunday night. It was an awesome service. And a lot of people told me it was awesome. That don't come to this church. One guy got come up to me and says, why don't us all churches get together in Walter and just be one big church? I said, that would be awesome. I said, we're kind of doing that. God is a good God, people. He's given us an indescribable gift. And all you have to do is believe. Amen. And when you believe, you'll do something about it just like God did. For God so loved the world, he gave. Put your name in there. How much do you give to others? How much? We learn that by having a faith. Amen? Or being in a faith. When everybody works together, things roll. And like I said, I was just so proud of Sunday night. The people that sung specials, they was all anointing. I mean, it was awesome. And it touched people's hearts. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus, well, go ahead. I have a little story. I um, teach one of my grandkids, and I took them shopping for their parents. And you said something about not getting the right gift. These little kids went out, and they picked what they thought their mother needed. And I know their mothers didn't want any of it. But you should have seen their eyes. When I let them pick it out, I give them the money, they paid for it, they did everything. And you should have seen their eyes when their mothers opened their gifts. And and it was just, it was cool to see it. Now I used to do this when I worked at, at the post office. I would pick up a kid out of the school every year and I would take one kid shopping. And I would, I wouldn't give them a limit because it's hard for little kids to know what money is, you know. So we, I would do that for these little kids on the mail route. And, but the cutest thing, my grandson, he's three, and he was one of the last ones I took shopping. And we got in the car and we started talking who he was going to buy for and what he wanted to buy. And he only wanted to buy everybody black chips. And... And the, <laughs> we went to the grocery store one day and he said, I want some chips, Grandma, and I want the black ones. 
All it is is a red, white, and black bag of chips. He didn't know what kind they were or what. So when we went Christmas shopping, we had to get 16 bags of black chips. So everybody at the party can have black chips. And you should have seen the smile on that little boy's face when everybody opened their black chips and had chips like him. And and just we just got to remember... Lady on the mail route one day told me, I told her, you don't have to give me nothing, you know, I, you just, and she said, you're taking all my blessings away. We have to remember, we all are givers, we all do it, but we have to be able to learn to receive what they give us and enjoy it. When they take that much time, my one little, he had to have the right color, the right size, everything, and when they take that much time and effort to pick something out for you, we need to enjoy it. You know, like Jesus gives to us because he loves us. These kids and our family and people around us, they go out and spend time to pick out things for us because they love us. So we have to learn to be, I call it gracious receivers, you know, because just watching that little boy's eyes and everybody was all, you know, we got chips and everybody kind of looked at him, but they knew where it come from because they were his black chips. So, you know, Jesus gives to us, and people around us give to us. I know sometimes, you know, you think, man, I don't even need that. But guess what? They took the time to go and pick it out for you. And, and you know, I, I always say, my mom said, why do you spend so much time, you know, doing things and buying gifts? Well, I feel that if I spend the time and go out there and look and do, it makes it more important. Anybody can hand me a $20 bill. But when you go to a store and pick something out, especially for them, just like the little kids my grandkids did, two or three hours we were in the store, he had to find the right gifts. That ain't for me. Two or three hours in the store? Yes. <laughs> but, you know what I'm saying? I know. What when they pick things out for you and take time to do it. You know why? Exactly. You know why he had a smile on his face? Because he gave. Yes, he did. He was so excited to be able to give them a and, you know, he was even telling everybody at the store why he was buying them and, and, you know, all the stuff that he was doing and why he was doing it. So, you know, when people go and, you know, I, I love shopping. I do. When I used to go Good Friday shopping, I would go there and everybody would say they'd be so irritated and they'd push people down and I'd stand in line and make new friends, you know. But, you know, we just... That one, there was two older ladies that I delivered mail to, and I, they were in home, so I'd have to walk in, and they would give me a gift every day. They'd give me something, and they'd say, "You know, you're taking my blessings away if I can't give to you." Amen. And Jesus did that for you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Remember that. When you love, you'll give. That's the bottom line. That's what God is love. And he gave. And we're the beneficiaries of that. We didn't deserve them. We just received them. It's so simple, people. And once you love Jesus and what he did for you, you're going to give. You're going to give to the church. You're going to give to people, those that are in need. You're going to touch lives. Amen. So let's touch lines, you know? That's what Jesus did. He did it for you when you didn't even deserve it. You know Jesus is your personal Savior? I just wanted to thank Candy for sharing that because it's just like when Jamie shared how the lights just went off and light of her. It just as she was sharing, I'm thinking just what you what you said too. So you you also receive that is Jesus did that for us. He wants us to have it and, and we rob him of a blessing when we don't receive what he has for us, what he's given us. And it's just I just wanted to thank Candy for that because that's you know at 61 years old, just that reality, you know, he wants us to have it. He wants us to have an abundant life. He wants us to enjoy Him. We get to enjoy a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
We don't have to perform to get him to love us. That's a reward, you know. He loves us so much. And just, I, you know, he probably has Candy's hurt as he looks down at us and he thinks, "I just enjoy you. I just enjoy being with you. I love you so much." And um, when Katina shared, you know, that she just heard one chord, and I think that's just what God wants to hear from us: that we are in one accord that we are united in reaching the world with the love of Jesus Christ. That's just that. Merry Christmas. You know, Merry Christmas. Jesus came and he's coming back. He's going to come back and get us. And he's provided for us all along the way. Amen. He provided for the Israelites too. Even when they wasn't following him. <laughs> I mean, they was grumbling and complaining, and he still provided man for them. Unconditionally. Because he said he would. Dolores. Uh, this morning, Jamie gave me a gift from the girls. It's point seven. Amen. And I thought, it's so special of that. Amen. Amen. Okay, don't leave here without Jesus. Take him with you. Amen? Amen? He wants to be with you. He sent his son so that we could be with him. He's coming again. Could be sooner than you think. God spoke that to me. I'm coming soon. I'm coming sooner than you think. Tell my people I'm coming soon. I don't have to memorize that because I heard it. Amen. And yeah, maybe you didn't hear any chords, high chord and chords. It don't matter. She did. Three times. Something about three times. He was in a grave three times. You look it up in the Bible how many times I you. God's a good God, people. Share him. Give him away. Amen? Let's stand our feet. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And even as I remember, I ask that you would do something special here today. And you do. In many different ways, Father. Whether it was pipe organs or anointed songs. Or Father, having the same message as a song. You're an awesome God. And like someone said, if we can just be of one accord and one mind. There's nothing you can't do. Father, we thank you. You're an awesome, awesome God. We've seen so much, and we'll give you all the credit, Father. It's not because of our righteousness. It's because of Jesus' righteousness. So, Father, help us to be givers of our time, of our blessings, givers of you and the gospel. Father, we thank you for what you're doing here. We can only give you the praise because none of us are worthy. But it's because of what Jesus does that makes us worthy. Father, we ask that you would just be with each one as we have Christmas or Christmas Eve tonight or tomorrow, Father. Keep each one safe as they travel. Watch over them. Protect them. And Father, let them enjoy life. Have it abundantly. Not only just one day of the year, but every day. But you've set us free. Now, Father, thank you for this time together. Watch over and keep each one as we leave here today. 
Father, we pray for the food that's in the back. We pray that you would bless it, bless the hands that prepared for it. Bless the fellowship, Father, as those that stay and just fellowship and tell their story of what God's done for them. We'll give you the praise, the honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Great two or three people and your